Okay, this chapter um, I'm taking out of Carlton is chapter three on electricity. And it may help to read this chapter before you go into chapter four, electromagnetism. Um, it, there's a reason why it was put as three and electromagnetism was put at four. It'll help you understand chapter four. So if you're a little confused in chapter four, uh, make sure you go through chapter three. It'll help explain. So there's some objectives here. Make sure you can answer these objectives and the questions also in the back of the book. Very important that you're able to identify and explain each of those. So when we're talking about electricity, we're talking about the atomic um, nature of electricity first. So we're going to talk about the protons and electrons. So protons, as you know, are the smallest unit of positive charge. It's within the nucleus of an atom, where electrons are the smallest unit of negative charge, and they're free to move between um, orbitals and atoms. So um, it's been stated that electricity concerns the distribution and movement of electrons and has little to do with the positive charges of protons locked within the nucleus. So electrostatic, um, it's a study of the distribution of fixed charges or electric charges at rest. So electrification is the process of electron charges being added or subtracted from an object. So it can be positive or negative, but that's relative and I'll explain why at the bottom. So um, we use the earth as um, zero or the ground as it has an infinite reservoir and it's considered neutral. So when we talk about the positive and negative in relative terms, um, the term positive and negative refers to the relationship between two objects, not their true atomic charges. So um, we're not looking at P proton positive and um, the negative electron. We're talking about how overall the atom changes to positive or negative, not necessarily that it is positive or negative, but compared to one versus the other, it could be more negatively charged or more positively charged, typically negatively charged. We'll explain why. So there's uh, several laws of electrostatics. So there's a repulsion and the attraction. So like charges repel and unlike charges um, attract. As you can see here, A is neutral and B, you can see that the like charges are repelling each other and they're attracted to the opposite. And you see here that they're attracted to each other. So there's also the inverse square law. So the force between two charges is directly proportional to their product and their magnitudes and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So this is the same formula that you use for the inverse square law within radiation. So if the distance is doubled, charges drop by 25% of the original value. So same, same idea. All right, there's also the distribution. So Charges reside on the external surface of conductors and um, equally throughout non-conductors. So uh, they are always trying to repel from each other. Like charges don't like each other and they try to get away from each other. This results in equal distribution on the surface, which is the point where the electrons can obtain maximum distance from each other. So as you can see here, um, they are all equally distant from each other because they're repelling each other. So they're out on the surface there. Concentrations. So the greatest concentration of charges will gather at the sharpest area of the curvature. So as you can see here, at real sharp turns, they'll be the highest concentration. So within the x-ray tube, you'll uh, begin to realize that there's no sharp points anywhere. Everything is rounded because we don't want any kind of concentration of those electrons in one specific area. If enough electrons congregate, they can induce ionization of the surrounding air in a tube, I know there's no air, and even discharge to the nearest point of lower concentration. So um, that's what we're looking at. We don't wanna have any sharp turns. So as you can see here, they're all evenly distributed. And then here you can see there's a sharp turn and there's a higher concentration. Movement. Only negative charges move along solid conductors. Positive charges, or the protons, are tightly bound inside the atomic nuclear field, so they're not flowing like the negative electrons. Only electrons are easily moved along conductors. So, methods of electrification. So there's um, friction, contact, and induction. 
Friction occurs when one object is rubbed on another. Due to the difference in the number of electrons available on each, electrons travel from one to the other. So one idea is rubbing a balloon on a wool sweater. You could put it up against a smooth wall and it'll stay. Also, brushing your hair like during the Santa Ana winds, um, that is also the same thing, using friction. Contact occurs when two objects touch, permits electrons to move from one object to another. So walking across the floor is electrification by friction and touching a doorknob. Have you ever done that? Oh my gosh, it hurts. So, and that's electrification by contact. So a static discharge releases excess energy as light photons. So it's a little bit different. So um, when we're talking about electrification, we're talking about the balance between electrons from one object to another, where one has a higher concentration and the other item does not. It's a lower concentration. Um, so it, it's the exchange of electrons, whereas the static discharge is actually um, a release as light photons. So you, in the dark, if you lift up your blanket really fast, you can see the light photons of the static. Okay, so an electroscope. So um, charging an electros electroscope by contact. So electrons distribute evenly when they are permitted to move from one object, um, the rod, to another the electroscope by contact. So you can see when we add the rod, that all the electrons are attracted are attracted to the rod and have um, spaced out evenly. So you can see here without the rod that they are just kind of attached to it just randomly here. And you can see that the foil leaves are pulled away because they are repelling each other. So these move. So when when um, you attach the rod, they're repelling each other so much that it flares out that foil leaf. That's the idea of that. So induction, um, used in operation of electronic devices, uh, processes of electronic fields acting on one another without contact. So um, every charged body is surrounded by a force field. Force fields are called elect electric fields also because they cause induction. So when a strong or weak charge object come close to one another, the electrical fields will begin to act on uh, one another before contract occurs. So just getting within close proximity, it's like people's aura. You can feel the aura. Um, sometimes if there's an electric field and you step into it, you can feel it. Your hair will stand up. Kind of cool. So electrodynamics, there is the electrical current, the properties of conducting materials, there's electrical circuit, and there's the electron sources. So Within electrodynamics, when we look at the electrical current, it's electrons moving in the same direction. So that is how we get a current. So properties of conducting material. So the metallic conductors such as copper and aluminum are normal. Um, insulators are non-conducting materials such as plastic and rubber. So um, there's metals, so silver, copper, gold, um, the different metals that are good conductors, whereas plastic and rubber, as you know, are not good conductors. So the electrical circuit is a pathway. Um, it's commonly a copper wire uh, that permits electrons to move in a complete circle from the source. So you remember hearing on the news all the people stealing all the copper wiring um, from like baseball fields. Uh, the copper is worth a lot of money and we use the copper wiring. So they're getting away from the copper wiring now um, as it is really expensive. It has a really low melting point. So. Um, electron sources, where we get these electrons, are from batteries, generators, solar converters, and atomic reactors, which are going away. Describing current flow. So electrons move from areas of highest to lowest concentration. Um, conventional current flow is, as you can see, using balls as a model here. So we're coming in, the tube fills with the balls, and then it goes to the little area of lower concentration. Characteristics of electrical circuit, so um, quantity of electrons flowing is your current and the force with which they travel is your potential difference. So conventional electric uh, current is described as going from positive to negative poles while electron flow is actually from negative to positive poles. So when we talk about the right hand left hand rules, we're talking about um, the current is going to be opposite of the electron flow. So that's what um, in chapter four, what we're talking about. 
So characteristics of electric circuit. So opposition to current flow is the impedance or the resistance. Um, the direction of travel, so alternating current versus direct current, so AC versus DC. Direct uh, current is when all the electrons move in the same direction, where alternating current is when the electrons move in opposite directions, so they go, remember the sine wave, so they're going part of the way with positive, part of the way with negative. So the current is the quantity or the number of electrons flowing past a given point per unit of time. It's usually measured in seconds. So um, current is the ampere, which we also reduce it down to the amp, and it has a symbol of A, it is the unit of um, current, and one C per second, which is coulomb per second. So one coulomb equals 6.24 times 10 to the 18 charges. So technical definition is one coulomb of electrical charge flowing per second. So one ampere equals one coulomb per second. Um, when adding an additional 100 MA on the console when you're shooting an x-ray, it causes 6.24 times 10 to the 7, 17 more electrons per second to pass through the x-ray tube. Crazy, huh? So that might be a Jerry question right there, just so you know. Okay, potential difference. Force that drives electrons. So the function of the difference function of the difference between the number of electrons in excess at one end of the circuit and the deficiency at the other end of the circuit. So the force or strength of electron flow. So your electromotive force, so the EMF, the total maximum difference of potential between the positive and the negative ends of the electron source. It can be used as the same as potential difference. So it's interchangeable with potential difference. So voltage, EMF used to do work. So the potential difference is the volt. One joule of work done on one coulomb of charge. So one volt equals one joule uh, over coulomb, one coulomb. Um, area of higher or lower concentration of electrons and unequal forces tried to balance. So the resistance is the amount of opposition to current is measured in ohms and it has the omega as the sign. Uh, so when you see the omega, you'll know it's resistance. It's dependent upon four things, the material's conductivity, the length, the diameter, and the temperature. So the material's conductivity is dependent on the configuration of the atoms. So we're talking about the valence energy band and the conduction band. So with the valence energy band, the outermost and sometimes next to outermost orbital shells, what we're talking about, determines the chemical property of the atom. It's also called the conductivity. So the conduction band um, is not an orbital shell, but is within the force field area of influence of the atom. Conductors have conduction bands that are populated by free electrons, and in solid materials, they are able to move freely from one atom conduct band to another's. So here's um, an example of the uh, conduction bands, valence bands, and field bands. So with an insulator, semiconductor, and a conductor. So the arrows demonstrate the difference between the energy levels of the conduction and valence bands in A here, the insulator, and B, the semiconductor, and C, the conductor. Note that the uh, conduction and valence bands overlap in a good conductor. So here, these all overlap for a good conductor. So the length is directly related to the resistance. As the length of the conductor doubles, the resistance also doubles. The diameter, inversely related to the resistance. As the cross-sectional diameter doubles, the resistance will be halved. So think of a garden hose. I think this is the example in the book. So if you have a real small diameter garden hose, you're going to have very high velocity coming out the other end, whereas you have a really big fire hose with the same um, pressure coming into it, it's just going to kind of dribble out. So uh, the diameter of the um, of the um, uh, conductor is a big deal. Temperature, so it's directly related to resistance. Increased atomic motion due to increased temperature prevents electrons from freely flowing. So if we look here, this is just your your regular conductor here. So as you see, um, as the resistance goes up, so does the temperature. But here with the semiconductor, as um, you can see the resistance dropping and the temperature dropping in the insulator here also. 
So Ohm's law, so V equals IR. V is the potential difference in volts, I is the current in amperes, and R is the resistance in ohms. So to solve this, it's a mathematical relationship between the factors of current, potential difference, and the resistance that applies to all uh, resistance circuits. So if you want to cover up the I here, it would be V over R. You want to cover up the R is V over I. So um, that's how you solve for Ohm's law. So V equals IR, and you can just draw this out on your test so that you don't get it wrong. Power, same idea. Um, P equals IV. The P is power, which is measured in watts, and the I is the current, which is amperes, and V is the potential difference, which is the volts. So the unit of power is the watt because the total amount of energy available in the circuit is determined by the current, amperage, and potential difference of the voltage, um, the watt is defined as one ampere flowing through one volt. Series and parallel circuits. So an electrical circuit can be designed to send electrons through various resistance uh, devices by either a series circuit or a parallel circuit. So when we look at a series circuit, we're linking them one after another and it operates at 675 volts. So the idea is like hanging your Christmas lights. So you plug in one after another after another where if one goes out, your whole string goes out. With a parallel circuit, you're giving each component an individual branch. So it operates at 64 volts, so it's a lot lower. Um, if one light goes out, then it breaks only in that parallel branch. So here is a series circuit. So you can see here we've got your resistance 1, 2, and 3, where the series circuit, um, it comes all the way around, and you've got your resistance 1, 2, and 3. So you have a, a, a um, parallel with each other, where this is in a series Okay, a variable resistor, so a potentiometer and a rheostat. So permits a variable contact to slide along a series circuit of resistant coils, can cause significant energy waste and heat, and the direct application of Ohm's law results in voltage changing only when an average um, amperage change is desired and vice versa. So it's not practical in high voltage situations. So um, that's wrapping up your electricity uh, lecture from me. Uh, you're going to want to read your chapter three along with your Bouchon. Um, this is just out of Carleton. Make sure you take good notes with Jerry so that you are sure to be well versed in everything. I will post some videos for you and some worksheets.